Saturday, the 21st of September, and it's a beautiful day across London. A big event taking place in the capital today is Swim Serpentine, a water swimming festival in Hyde Park. Thousands of participants taking part for good causes across the UK. Those involved aren't just raising money and awareness for the big charities. Some of the swimmers will be putting the lesser-known organisations in the spotlight. And one of those is Nerve Tumors UK. It's very hard, isn't it? Because... Um as a parent, you want to be able to take away the pain. And with this type of pain, we're right when she says, you don't know how I feel, she's absolutely right. <laughs> when she was born, she had a very obvious lump in her fontanelle in the soft spot in her head. Um, she had very purple feet, didn't she? Yeah, yeah. She had um, a lot of bruising marks over her face. As she did get to about 20 months, the lump that was on her head started to stop her skull from closing. So it was then decided that it would need to be removed. By this time it wasn't clear why it was there no. or why it had formed there. Three years old, we noticed a lot of um, marks appearing. I, rightly or wrongly, did my own research. So I went along to the GP and said, I think she has neurofibromatosis type one. Um, and the doctor actually said, I think you're right. She wasn't officially diagnosed until she was six. Neither of us have the gene, so it's a completely spontaneous chromosome difference. The NF1 gene makes a protein called neurofibromin, and neurofibromin is called a tumor suppressor. And what that means is it controls the way that our cells grow and divide. She's had some social challenges. She's been unable to read situations and it's led to a lot of friendship difficulties. She can't understand that what she says may be hurtful. We've gone through some behavioural challenges. She's been very physical, quite aggressive towards us, hasn't yeah. she? she yeah. At times, her short-term memory is not great. Long-term is phenomenal. Mm. And she's got a photographic memory, unbelievably so. As she's getting older, she's experiencing very regular daily pain, isn't she Aches really? And, pains, yeah. and the yeah. itching, constant itchy itchy skin. The other night her top of her left foot was just tingling away and she couldn't she was in tears. She was in she? tears, she couldn't settle, go to sleep and we just felt helpless. You know pain doesn't feel good. Um, and it's sensory and emotional. You know, grief is pain. Heartbreak is pain. You know, we're not just talking about physical, we're talking about our experience as humans. We try and you know support each other. Obviously, the best we can. Like I'm having a wobble, you know, yeah. I'm having a bit of a bad day. Thinking mm. thoughts I don't want to think and shouldn't have to think for such a young person. But you know, and then but then you just try and reassure each other and say that she's she's being monitored from a young age, and that's what we cling on to. Yeah, yeah. so it's a big old journey for somebody so young. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Until I was 16, I'd never heard of NF2. I just had a kind of normal life, sporty, academic, uh, musical, played lots of instruments. Probably about 
about 14, 15, began to get bad balance, bad headaches, and went to the doctor, and long story short, diagnosed with these big tumours in my head, and I learned that NF2 means you can grow uh, tumours on nerves anywhere in the body, but they had to be removed. Death in intensive care after that surgery, and in fact, the doctors were um, thinking of switching off my life support machine because they thought I wouldn't make it. My parents had to give permission for that, they didn't switch off the machine, and I lived. Uh, but I couldn't do anything, I couldn't walk, I couldn't talk, I couldn't move, um, and I had to learn to do everything all over again. At university, I started getting the same symptoms, I had a scan, the tumour had grown big again, so they removed that tumour. And when they did, they damaged my facial nerve because the nerves were all very close in the head. So that's why half my face doesn't move. Two years later, the tumour on the other side had grown so big it had to come out and that left me deaf. It was a shock to be sitting there and told, <laughs> not, I can give you tablets to help your headaches, but you've got brain tumours. But after I had the surgery and was recovering and realising I couldn't do things, it was really hard and actually I had to learn almost who the new kind of me was because I couldn't do what I used to be able to do, you know. I wasn't the person that used to be able to go for a cross-country run. I still felt like that person inside, so it was really, really... I felt like I was trapped inside a body that wasn't really mine. Gradually, I came to terms with the fact that I'm still me, but a different sort of me. I can do different things. And for me, I had to accept that, otherwise I couldn't have carried on living. Spinal surgery, which left me uh, paralysed from the waist down. In fact, the doctor thought I'd never walk again. After weeks of nothing, my leg twitched like a really small twitch, and I thought, oh, I used to be quite sporty. So I've got that mentality that, okay, let's push it, let's push it. So I got myself walking again, but I still can't walk very far, and actually, for distances, I have to go in a wheelchair. I have my trusty crutch, <laughs> and you know, it helps me get around. Obviously, not being able to hear is a big thing. Fatigue, I get very tired. I was like, why are you so tired? You should be able to carry on. But then gradually, I accepted that, okay, I will be tired, so give, it, give myself a break. They really are a lifeline in so many ways, not only for the information online electronically at the touch of a button, but you've got somebody at the end of a phone, at the end of an email. Having somebody there that I know I can contact if needs be and um, linking me up with other people who've got the condition. It's going to be an important charity not only for us but for Lily as she gets older it's um you want to raise money to keep that going and, and awareness because like, like we said it's not a very well understood it's not. Um, condition so we are available on a monday and a wednesday for any questions that you may have uh, we provide telephone support of course we're a listening ear and we're there for people with any sort of query uh, no matter how small or how big a bit of a relief for us that to know that other people were experiencing what we were, as a family, experiencing. It was really exciting to go see my dad do fun music. It was great, yeah. Everyone come up to London and, and showed their support and everything. I made a sign for him once, and once I made it, I found a white t-shirt and I would go daddy on it. <laughs> he did. He did.
long, long time for me to come to terms with it. And when I say a long time, I mean years. And we do our, do our best not to let it get us down and not let it stop us doing too much. In the end, I did realise that I had a choice. Either I move on or I don't. So either I just stay wallowing in this life. I, I'll be honest, I didn't want this life. But I could either live it or I couldn't, so I chose to carry on. It does drag her down a bit, as it would do, but equally, you're very determined on, mm. on other days not to think, it, no, really. I'm, not, I'm gonna, not gonna let it beat me. So. <laughs> Sometimes it was literally, can I get through the next five minutes? Yes, I can, yes, I can, yes, I can. And then gradually five minutes becomes a day, becomes a week. And you, I realised that actually this life I didn't want is okay. And actually, <laughs> I almost do want it because it's fine. Every Saturday, I always bring my mum and dad a cup of tea in bed, and they say it's the best cup of tea in the house. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. <laughs>